Greetings, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to this latest edition of Tales, Tales from, from Outer, Outer Space. Space. I hope you enjoy. Humans Aren't Invincible, written by Hmm. Humans are a lot of things. My many years of being a captain, I've seen their strengths firsthand, many times. Most notably for the ship is their social aspects. As an expedition vessel crew, cohesion is very important, and our resident human muscle has always been the linchpin for all of the species on board. We get along fine, yes, but not as well as with them here. As such, I've had to deal with the humans' tendencies to uh, socialize. Frankly, it has not been an issue at all, except for some noise complaints that I've had to reprimand them for every now and again. But that is not what I'm here to document. Along with all their quirks, most notably is their range as a species. And I use range in a statistical way, as often very wildly, especially if you only have a few individuals as reference. Their spectrum as a species is greater than any other, often for vastly different reasons from individual to individual. You see, with all that variation and reactions to certain situations are very interesting. Most notably, however, is a person from my crew that we lovingly refer to as Glacier, because he rarely shows any emotions beyond enjoying or disliking things. After talking to him about it, he mentioned that he had to make an armor, as when he was a child, he was too kind, too nice. He explained that he was so nice that back then, his teacher called his parents after school one day, because he had hit a kid, and his teacher was so proud of standing up for himself. I obviously found this weird, as my experience with humans was that they did their best to protect things they deemed cute, and what he had just described sounded like that. He elaborated, saying that I had only met small groups of humans, but there are more than enough that would wholeheartedly take advantage of a person like that. He was so nice that he loved all his friends, and he loved his parents, and yet... He was born into a military family, forever fated to move and lose those he cared about. And so he was forced to put up this armor, which he was very proud of, even if he saw the limitations of it. I felt bad, because despite all the rumors in the galaxy, I had grown very fond of humans. But this was a reminder that they are a death willed species, and not a nice one at that. And so I got a newfound respect for glaciers, but also a want to comfort him, I guess was the best way to describe it. But quite honestly, I did not know how, as this was a fringe case even for humans, and I was no shrink, just a captain. And even if I could, the comfort wouldn't reach him under all the armor as if he himself told me. So I called a meeting with the other humans secretly after the lights out. It seemed like this wasn't a surprise to them, even though they didn't know the details. They said they expected something along those lines. He didn't seem like the type with a dark origin story, but a slightly melancholic one seemed to fit. They said that they had known each other for a while and tried to help, but the glacier didn't need help. He seemed to enjoy the comfort of his protection. So we tried to come up with an idea to lower those defenses so that we could really get to him. I liked this idea, and I write in revolving his friends to help. Our first solid idea was an intervention. However, this was shot down by Glacier's CO. He mentioned that more so than most modern humans, he was very much a beast of instinct. So if he cornered him, then he would most likely lash out, try to flee, or bolster his defense. Even if it was just his closest of friends talking to him. The more I insisted, the more I grew sad as if I was watching a stray chert, who I wanted to bring home away from the rain, who was too scared to accept my love for it. Except in this case, it wasn't a foot-long fuzzy baby, but a six-foot-tall hairless great ape who would easily break a bone of mine. That was until our combat engineer Abigail, aka Abby, had an idea. Hey Cap, if I'm getting this right, you want to help him, yes? Like saving a sheltered dog that is aggressive only because it's scared. Abby had asked as if knowing exactly the answer. Not liking why my humans act like that, I tentatively answered, y y yes. I had seen their dogs before, a lot sharper than the Chutel, but their puppies were comparable to the Chut. Well, I have never seen him drop his facade per se, 
but I have seen cracks in it once, she said, with a smile similar to that weird interdimensional cat from the fairy tale that humans love so much. Looking around the room, it seemed to dawn on the brighter of the bunch, but the rest, including me, were lost. She continued, When we were docked in Eden 7, there was a very attractive harpy, and as you know, they can, uh, sense, I guess, emotional states, and similar to you, Cap, it seemed that she wanted to pamper old Glace and take him to her place where she could properly, uh, care for him. That was the one and only time it looked like his armor was gone, like he didn't know what to do. He truly seemed to be scared crapless, but didn't make a single move or even twitch to move or run away. After that, she had to clarify herself that no, she was not insinuating that we should force someone to have sex with him. That's just fucking stupid and weird, as she said. What she was actually insinuating was next time he said something even mildly depressing, I should just treat him like a wet, shivering puppy who has a broken leg and comfort him as much as I can. I wondered why I was to do this, not that I minded, but wasn't it better if we all did? The CEO answered again, if we corner him like that, he'll most likely just brush it off. It has to be more personal. And, well, we are too human, after all. Don't forget we built those walls to keep humans out, not aliens. Everyone nodded to that. Abby added, And he's joked enough about his taste in women that at this point I'm fairly certain he has mommy issues. And what better way to play to that than being comforted by a ten-foot-tall wolf mummy with massive bazooka. A quick smack on the back of her head shut her up before the CEO continued. While the details were unnecessary, I do agree that if we want to help Glacier to be more emotionally open, we need to lower his defenses. And it seems to do that you check all the boxes here, Chief. Quite honestly, at this point, I was astounded. I knew humans were emotional creatures, but still, I could tell how much they wanted to help their friend. Glacier and I had started a weekly tea time, as he called it. It was how I originally heard his story, and so the plan was to do it then. The tea was fantastic as always, but the conversation was more stilted than normal. While he had not changed, now instead of a grand immobile obelisk, I could only see a scared and lonely chute, hiding as deep in the earth as it could. It happened when we were discussing the new recruits and the people they replaced. As stoic as ever, he said, People come and people go. Be it strangers or family, nothing is constant. Being sad about it helps no one. It only slows you down. It's the sad reality of life. But once you accept it, life gets easier. He said with a half smile. Before, I would have brushed it off as his unique utilitarian philosophy. But now, now I only saw a boy who loved all the people he met, but was cursed with having to lose them over and over, resigning himself to what he believed was inevitable. I couldn't help myself. I grabbed him out of his chair and hugged him as tight as I could. I needed him to feel that people wouldn't leave, that he could be kind and nice. He was stiff at first, obviously not knowing what to do, but as Abby said, he made no move to stop this, so I didn't. We stood there for long enough time for the lights to turn off. I simply held him and told him that it would be all right, that sometimes it's good to be sad, just for a bit. It took a while, longer than a while, for him to so much as tighten his grip from my fur. Not long after then, I could feel him shaking. Not a lot. Probably so little that you wouldn't tell visually by the way he liked it. I sat him down on the soft, warm, rec room floor, where he curled his legs in and started to cry. I held him like a mother protecting her young. He didn't cry much, nor like the other humans. He made no noise, not even a lot of tears came out. He just sat in my arms, slightly shaking. I thought this was as good a time as any to pry a little deeper, and so I did, and he opened up. He told me his life story. He was always loved and respected. On the surface, nothing to complain about, but his situation was anything but ideal. He moved every two to three Earth years, each time losing basically all contact with his previous life no matter how close he was with them. His parents worked basically always, so he only had caretakers throughout his childhood. And after early childhood, he was basically alone. It was heartrending. I told him not to worry, 
because he would never lose me or the rest of his friends here. While he slightly smiled at that, he scoffed under his breath. At that, I pulled his face to mine and made it clear to him that we wouldn't leave. Staring into those bloodshot eyes, they burst out crying. I was honestly relieved, because this was an emotional reaction I knew from the other humans. He was finally opening up. It seemed the door wasn't completely closed as I heard shuffling and whispers of shock coming from it. Looking up behind Glacier's back, I saw his friends all looking amazed and happy. They gave me a thumbs up and other signs of approval and left. To this day, I am grateful for them as they were able to help me in helping their friend. After that, things returned to normal on the ship. Glacier was still his usual cold self, if not noticeably cheerier. He had thanked me for what I did. That confused me. Not because he did, but because he looked embarrassed. He had the same expression as the CEO has when he gets mail from his husband back home. However, what confused me most was that he was surprised that his crewmates didn't tease him about it. Apparently, everyone previously in his life would. What he didn't know was that I told them that, and of course, after our initial meeting, we didn't want him to lock himself off again, so we all paid extra close attention. The rest of the trip was fantastic. Glacier didn't like the idea of actual therapy or even talking too much about his feelings, but he did say he wouldn't mind hugs. Well, they did take a full bottle of vodka to get him to say that, but hey... If it works, it works, and even he couldn't find fault in our techniques, and he definitely is sharp enough to figure those out. But either way, now we sleep together. He says that he enjoys having someone to grab hold of at night. I postulated and he agreed that maybe it was because he wanted the reassurance that he wasn't alone. Either way, it was the cutest thing in the world to have him curl up in my arms, like that chut is now healthy and happy. Obviously, the crew have been making their slight remarks, human or not, but after showing the security footage, that stopped. To quote Abigail, that's just too pure to make fun of, and I hope it is, because maybe we might be getting the original ray of sunshine back from the glacier. Hmm. Maybe we should give him a new nickname. Ray does sound nicer than Glacier. End of story. I would quickly like to thank our tier 5 patrons and channel members. Casper Arnholt, Cam Maxwell, It's Difficult to Pronounce, Lord Arishakal, Dragzoon, WRE, and Arcadian. Thank you very much.